This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by Skillshare, home to over 25,000 classes that could teach you a new life skill. We rarely witness evolution on a time frame short enough for a single human life to take notice. These changes usually occur over many lifetimes, the gradual drift of a creature's DNA to best survive their environment. But in one case in the 1700s, humans witnessed evolution with their own eyes, and they caused it. This metamorphosis coincided with humans' rapid industrialization. We began burning coal on levels never before seen, and its byproducts rapidly changed the landscape for not just humans, but for the animals that shared the planet with them. The peppered moth was one of those animals, getting its name from its speckled white and black colouring, designed to camouflage the moth while it lay on lichen-covered tree barks. A black variant was first observed in 1811, many decades into the Industrial Revolution. At first, the mutation was rare, but humans' influence on the environment grew, and so did their numbers. By 1895, 95% of the peppered moths in Manchester had this black colouring. Surely this black colouring would leave them exposed, making them easier to spot for hungry birds. In reality, these moths had adapted to be harder to spot in this newly industrialised world, one stained by soot. And it may be time for humans to follow their lead, to evolve or die. The rate we have been spewing these pollutants into our atmosphere has only risen since this discovery. Our carbon dioxide emissions have risen from 1,600 million metric tons to 36,000 million metric tons since 1865. And despite our best efforts, that number is not declining. Human population and development are continuing to outpace our efforts to curb our carbon dioxide emissions. Just as alcohol producing yeast will eventually create an environment too toxic for itself to survive, humans are pumping the world's atmosphere with a gas that will eventually render the world unlivable for many, if something is not done. So we have to ask ourselves now, are we going the way of a mindless, single cell fungi that continue to poison their habitat until they die? Or are we going to recognise that the survival of the next generation is more important? Our previous videos have discussed ways to mitigate climate change by planting trees in the Sahara or by using aerosols to block out the sun. Both are pretty extreme methods and come with some big risks that could lead to some unforeseen consequences. Instead of some risky engineering tactic, what if we could just suck the CO2 right out of the air, undoing some of the damage that has been done? Well, in certain circumstances, this is already happening. Carbon capture and storage has been around for years. There are a few main types of carbon capture, almost all of which happens at power plants, capturing the carbon that comes directly from the plant. In post-combustion carbon capture, the CO2 is captured after the fossil fuel is burnt. In this method, carbon dioxide is separated from the flue gas, which includes carbon dioxide, water vapour, sulphur dioxides and nitrogen oxides, by bubbling the gas through an absorber column packed with liquid solvents, such as ammonia. In the most widely used system, once the chemicals in the absorber column become saturated, a stream of superheated steam at around 120 degrees is passed through it. This releases the trapped carbon dioxide, which can then be transported for storage elsewhere. In pre-combustion carbon capture, carbon dioxide is trapped before it's diluted by other flue gases. The fossil fuel is heated in pure oxygen, resulting in a mix of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. The carbon monoxide is reacted with water to produce carbon dioxide, which is captured along with hydrogen. The hydrogen can then be used to produce electricity, and the carbon dioxide is stored. Pre- and post-combustion carbon capture can prevent 80-90% to 90 of the power plant's carbon emissions from entering the atmosphere. This is a big deal. The IPCC estimates that carbon capture and storage has the potential to make up between 10 and 55% of the total carbon mitigation effort until the year 2100. However, this carbon has to be stored somewhere. It is most often stored underground in a process called geological sequestration which involves injecting the carbon dioxide into underground rock formations. It is stored as a supercritical fluid, meaning it has properties between those of a gas and a liquid. When carbon dioxide is injected at depth, it will remain in supercritical condition as long as it stays in excess of 31.1 degrees and at a pressure in excess of 72.9 atmospheres. Many times the carbon dioxide is injected into a reservoir which previously trapped oil and gas, since those areas have natural rock formations that help to contain the carbon dioxide. 
While this might be an okay solution, no one knows for sure what the environmental impact could be if the carbon dioxide were to leak out into the environment in large quantities. In some instances, leakage of carbon dioxide underground has been shown to increase plant mortality, reduce growth, and create potentially severe localized damage to ecosystems. For this to be a viable, safe option, the carbon dioxide would need to remain stored for hundreds of years, or even indefinitely, and the feasibility of this is not certain. Other methods of storing carbon include sinking it deep below the ocean, at depths under 3,500 meters, where it turns into a slushy material that will sink to the ocean floor under that amount of pressure. But this method is largely untested, and again, there are concerns about what this could mean for marine life, and uncertainty on whether or not the carbon dioxide could eventually make its way back into the environment. There have been more promising experiments in carbon storage in Iceland, where researchers have shown that pumping carbon dioxide into volcanic rock underground can speed up the natural process where the basalts react with the gas to form carbonate minerals, which make up limestone. This is an encouraging development, but it has its limitations. It requires large amounts of water, 25 tons for each ton of carbon dioxide buried, meaning this process would be limited to coastal sites. Another is that subterranean microbes might break down carbonate to methane, another powerful greenhouse gas. And while 80 to 90% of a power plant's carbon emissions can, in theory, be captured and stored in one of many ways, what about all the other carbon emitting things in our world? Only 25% of global greenhouse gas emissions come from electricity and heat production at power plants. Transportation, General industry and agriculture collectively make up around 60% of greenhouse gas emissions. Is there a way to capture carbon dioxide from these sources? Direct air capture has, up to recently, been a largely theoretical technique in which carbon dioxide is removed directly from the atmosphere. Theoretical because doing this on a scale that would even make a dent has historically been ridiculously expensive. Some experts say as much as $600 per metric ton of carbon dioxide. For reference, a typical passenger vehicle emits about 4.6 metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. But recently, a team of scientists from Harvard University and the Bill Gates funded company Carbon Engineering announced that they have found a method to cheaply pull carbon dioxide pollution out of the atmosphere. They say for as little as $94 and no more than $232 per metric ton of carbon dioxide. This means it would cost between $1 and $250 to remove the carbon dioxide released by burning a gallon of gasoline in a modern car. And not only do they suck the carbon dioxide out of the air with the ability to store it, they will also transform the carbon back to gasoline or jet fuel, creating net neutral carbon based fuels. While this sounds too good to be true, the methods they use to pull carbon dioxide out of the air is not too different from what has already been done for decades. This type of direct air capture starts with an air contractor. This structure wet scrubs the air by using a strong hydroxide solution to capture CO2 and convert it into carbonate. The hydroxide solution reacts with carbon dioxide to form carbonate ions. This occurs within a structure which is much the same as an industrial cooling tower. The next step involves a pellet reactor where the carbonate ions react with calcium to form calcium carbonate in the form of dried pellets. Then a circulating fluid heats the calcium carbonate pellets to decomposition temperature, breaking them apart to release carbon dioxide as a gas and leave behind calcium oxide. Finally, the carbon dioxide is combined with hydrogen and converted into liquid fuels including gasoline, diesel and jet fuel using the fischer tropsch process. This is a process where a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen are converted into liquid hydrocarbons. These reactions occur in the presence of metal catalysts and typically at temperatures of 150 to 300 degrees. This means the company can produce carbon neutral hydrocarbons, meaning if you were to burn this fuel in your car, you would release carbon dioxide pollution out of your exhaust and into the atmosphere. But because this carbon dioxide came from the air in the first place, these emissions would not introduce any new carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and no oil would need to be extracted from the earth to power your car. And perhaps most importantly for the economic viability of this idea, they can sell the product, which helps offset costs, allowing them to capture even more carbon dioxide to either convert back into hydrocarbons or ultimately store. And backing up their cost estimates of between $94 and $232 per metric ton of carbon dioxide is the fact that they've actually tested the technology in a prototype plant for a few years in Squamish, British Columbia, 
which offers a proof of concept that's way stronger than simple calculations or computational models. It currently captures and processes around one ton of carbon dioxide per day. However, for this idea to work on a large scale, the process has to be cost effective to implement cheaply around the world, without the massive cost of constructing all new factory parts. In the pilot plant, they pulled all of this off by designing a factory based entirely on parts that suppliers could already make cheaply, and by keeping careful track of their emissions and costs at each stage of the design and production process. They are currently seeking funding for an industrial scale version of the plant that will use low cost renewable energy that will produce 200 barrels of synthetic fuel a day, which they hope to complete by 2021. But how much carbon can they realistically hope to suck out of the air? In 2017, the world emitted about 32.5 gigatons of carbon dioxide. If this technology were built at a scale to suck all that back out of the atmosphere at $93 to $232 per tonne, simple math shows that the total cost would be between $3 trillion and $7.5 trillion. That seems like a lot, but many industries are worth more than that, including Apple or the airline industry. Definitely a tall order, but not impossible. For this idea to work globally in pulling substantial amounts of carbon dioxide from the Earth's atmosphere, there would need to be hundreds or thousands of scaled up plants producing hundreds of thousands of barrels of carbon neutral fuel to drive down costs further. In the same way that solar and wind energy costs have plummeted over the past decades with increasing scales. However, to keep global warming to less than 2 degrees, the international target to avoid the most dangerous impacts, we will need negative emissions, not carbon neutral emissions. We need carbon to be taken out of the atmosphere and stored permanently, or the problem will only plateau indefinitely. And if carbon engineering is making fuel from their captured carbon, this is only a carbon neutral plan. But the reality of the situation is that when you are only capturing and storing carbon, there is no market for that. The only way to pay for carbon being captured from the air and stored on a large scale would be government subsidies, and to rely on our governments to solve this problem is certainly a mistake. And at $100 per tonne at the moment, there aren't enough carbon dioxide buyers in the market for any other uses to make a dent. Thus, introducing the idea of selling back the carbon as a fuel is a way to fund such an effort. With market demand and money coming in, companies like Carbon Engineering can improve their technology, expand operations, store some carbon, and work towards making sure that less oil is extracted from the ground over time. Critics say that we should simply not be taking the carbon out of the ground in the first place, focusing on reducing emissions rather than capture and storage, or capture and reuse, and some worry that technology like this will allow us to think that we have no responsibility to reduce emissions, and it is cheaper to not emit a ton of carbon dioxide in the first place than to capture it. While these are definitely valid points, technology like this can and should play a role in how we tackle climate change. It's unrealistic to think that every industry, every consumer, and every government in the world will change their behavior in time to tackle the rising global temperatures, as much as we wish they would. And technology like this will go a long way to help mitigate the negative effects of the industries where a carbon zero result is next to impossible, like steel or cement manufacturing, or long distance air travel. So this may not be a silver bullet curing the world of climate change, but it is definitely a technology to be invested in as a tool in the toolbox to help solve the problem. And with direct air capture able to operate anywhere in the world where there is air, water and electricity, every country could, in theory, have their own supply of carbon neutral fuel. In the end, we are not mindless animals who cannot recognize the effect our behavior is having on the environment. There are thousands of people working to solve these problems associated with an ever-growing human population, with hundreds of startups using technology for the betterment of humankind. My audience is full of incredibly intelligent people who are more than capable of contributing to fixing our problems. So if you think you have what it takes to improve the world, you have probably thought about starting a company. You may not know where to start, but this course on Skillshare by a New York venture capital fund may help you. It will teach you how to generate and evaluate ideas for businesses while giving you incredible insight from an experienced investor on how to successfully grow a startup. This is just one of over 25,000 classes in a huge range of topics, ranging from creative skills like painting and music lessons to technical skills like coding. With professional and understandable classes that follow a clear learning curve, you can dive in and start learning how to do the work you love. 
a premium membership begins around $10 a month for unlimited access to all courses. But the first 1,000 people to sign up with this link will get their first two months for free. So ask yourself right now, what skill have you been putting off learning? What project have you been dreaming of completing but you aren't sure if you have the skills to do it? Why not start right now and sign up to Skillshare using the link below to get your first two months for free. You have nothing to lose and a valuable life skill to gain. As usual, thanks for watching and thank you to all my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to see more from me, the links to my Instagram, Twitter, Discord server and subreddit are below.